How you doing? I'm Pastor Chris. I'm the uh, associate pastor of Next Steps here. Uh, Jason is, is away this week. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, he introduced to me that I was preaching. And uh, I was excited, honored. Uh, and he's like, we're in between series, so it's all your choice, whatever you want. And I was like, the analogy I use to this, it's like a kid going into the candy store and saying, you could only pick one piece. So I looked, I prayed for a couple of weeks about it, and the one thing that kept coming to my mind in the heaviness of this year, during the year of Thanksgiving and Christmas, it's a topic that always comes to me as a counselor, as a pastor, and that's grief. Um, something about this time, it sparks memories of the past, right? Something about this time makes us think about how life changes, and we're hit with it just exactly at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Kids are not the same as they, they used to be. Their, their little kid giggles are now kind of adult giggles, and families change. People separate and grow distance between each other, or we lose someone we love, and they, they pass away. There's a lot of stuff that comes to a head right here at Thanksgiving and Christmas time. Um, often we deal with that by getting into the holiday spirit, which is a great way to deal with it, right? Or we just totally avoid the Christmas time. We're hoping for something to distract us from hard feelings. What else are we supposed to do with those, right? But underneath it is this aspect of grief, it's there. So uh, when I was in community college, I took a speech class. You had to take the speech class. Most people don't want to take the speech class, right? They say that the two biggest fears in life, number one is speaking, number two is death. And so most people would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy at the funeral. So I had to take the speech class, and they, had to, they gave us four speeches that we had to do. The last one was that we had to honor someone in a speech. And um, I thought about that. Everyone in the class was, was, was finding a grandmother or grandfather that had passed away that they wanted to honor, maybe a friend in high school that passed away, um, a lot of people were choosing like uh, dead icons like Martin Luther King Jr., all big things. And to be honest, I wasn't mature enough to handle that subject. To, to be quite honest, I may still not be mature enough to, to handle that. Um, but I decided that I wanted to honor someone that's very important in the life of a New Jersey state resident. Someone that everybody knows, someone that everybody likes, someone that they're slowly going away, and they're right here. The toll booth worker. I honored the toll booth worker with my speech. I talked about the dangers of being a toll worker, how they could get taken out at any moment in that little tiny booth, right? I, I even, uh, how do they even get in those toll booths? They have to run across traffic just to get into the toll booth. Uh, they have to dodge crazy drivers. They have to pick up those tokens, or they did have to pick up the tokens and the, the quarters on the ground while cars are driving through. Um, they were all losing their jobs to easy pass at the time, right? Uh, and so I ended the video, uh, the speech with a video, and it was the part in The Godfather where Sonny got killed right outside the toll booth because I wanted to talk about the dangers of being in a toll booth. The takeaway from all of it is I wanted to avoid talking about grief and loss, so I had to make it funny. I had to to, to make people laugh. I had to, to choose something else that was totally out there. 
totally not like anybody else's because the real fact is I didn't want to talk about grief and loss. And isn't that us to a T? We don't like talking about it. We don't like dealing with it. But here's it in the Bible. The Bible is filled with tragedies. Awful loss, hurts, pains. The Bible's not filled with a bunch of fortunate people who things just worked out for them. Read Job. There's a lot of stories like Job in the Bible. So how did these people deal with it? How did God have them work through the pain, the hurt, the grief? How did he show them how to heal to find wholeness? And maybe if we find the roadmap that they chose to get through that, maybe it can help us in our grief. And the answer to that is found in the art of the lament. Not a lot of people know what this is, but lamenting is an interesting thing in the Bible that people do when they are in pain. Our story today begins with a guy in the Bible named David. You may have heard of him, right? But uh, David is the king that Israel will always compare all their kings to. Even when we get to Jesus, they're hoping that Jesus is as good as David. He ends up being better because he's God in the flesh. David has his faults, but David was the best king that Israel ever had. Let me give you a little bit of background of David, all right? David was a shepherd boy who no one gave a chance. This little shepherd boy, nobody thought that this is going to be the next king, right? That shepherd boy ended up killing a giant in Goliath, right? And the king at the time was Saul, who was jealous of him. He tried to kill David, tried to kill him. David ran for his life. His best friend who saved his life was Jonathan, Saul's son. Those are all important to know as we go into our passage today. What had happened in our passage is that Saul and Jonathan, his good friends, yes, he considers Saul still his good friend, even though he tried to kill him, his good friends died in battle. And David is now processing his grief when his, his friends just passed away. So here's 2 Samuel, verse, chapter 1, 17 through 27. David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan, and he ordered that the people of Judah be taught this lament of the bow. It is written in the book of Jashar. A gazelle lies slain on your heights, Israel, how the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines be glad, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised rejoice. Mountains of Gilboa, may you have neither dew nor rain. May no showers fall on your terraced fields. For there the shield of the mighty was despised, the shield of Saul, no longer rubbed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back. The sword of Saul did not return unsatisfied. Saul and Jonathan, in the life, they were loved and admired. In death, they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were, my, you were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. How the mighty have fallen, the weapons of war have perished. Somewhere in your loss, there's been a major change, or you have lost somebody or something. It may have been unexpected. 
it may have been expected. Many of those relationships were close. Some had difficulties surrounding them, as did David with Saul. Either way, the loss, the change, it hurt. Whether you like to admit it or not, it hurt. What David does in this passage is he laments. It's a lament. It's much differently than emotionally exploding, right? It's, uh, which we do when we're hurting, and that's okay. The opposite of emotionally exploding is to tuck it in. This is more common. We tuck it in, slam it down, pretend like it's not there. We do one of the two. What a lament is, is waiting, thinking, praying, reflecting. Lament is like a slow cooker. It's letting everything boil to the surface. You're waiting, you're thinking, you're praying, you're reflecting, and all of it is coming out in a lament. It's rationally standing back, looking at the loss, feeling its weight. What does this mean? How will life change? This is grieving done in the right way. I often talk about uh, grief, and um, I, you know, I meet with people in counseling. I talk with people in the church, and 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 grief is a topic I talk about all the time. And uh, when I talk about grief, I always bring up this book that I read with my kids. Now, it's not a, a book on grief, but I felt like it was the most perfect thing in dealing with grief. Now, you may have heard of this before. We're going on a bear hunt. First off, the premise to the book is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. But often when you read your children's books, you're like, this is the stupidest thing in the world. I mean, this is a family that takes their children to go find a bear in a cave. Why would you do that? But anyway, it's fictional. Thank goodness we don't have to alert the authorities on anything like that. But in their search for this bear, they keep finding obstacles. Long, wavy grass, mud, snow. And every time they get to the obstacle, they keep saying this. You can't go over it. You can't go under it. You have to go through it. You can't go over it. You can't go under it. You have to go through it. When I walk with people through grief, I'm often saying this. You can't go over it. You can't go under it. You have to go through it. The biggest thing we often want to change is not, we don't want to deal with it when it comes to grief. And what this says here that you have to go through it. Many people like to stay busy. It's easier that way. But if you talk to the grieving person, they will tell you that the hardest times of day for them are the mornings and the night times. Because they're not busy during those times. And they have to think about it. And during those times, they have to go through it. And they don't like to feel it when it processes exactly what's needed. This lament that David wrote was so well scripted that he had a name for it. Often laments don't have names. And he called it the bow, which is the coolest thing, right? It's called the bow. Jonathan, his best friend, his favorite weapon was the bow. So he's honoring his best friend by calling it the bow. He said he loved the bow. He loved it. And he said he's going to teach this this lament, this song, to all the men of Judah, saying that Jonathan's legacy and his story is going to still go on. He wasn't lost in battle. He's still going on. Things are still, he's still going to teach people about Jonathan. This is the way to deal with grief. I just cringe when I often hear people say, Oh, that person hasn't gotten through that grief yet? Like, they're not over that yet? That happened a couple of years ago. They should, be, they should have moved on from that. And you want to know the secret 
to a lot of people is they hide their grief because they're thinking that people are thinking that exact same thing. They don't want people to think that they're crazy, that they still haven't gotten over the grief from years and years and years ago. They're embarrassed by it. So they tell nobody that they're still hurting from this grief because they assume that everybody thinks that they should have moved on from now. The truth is, grief works differently for different people. It always works differently. The bow is the process that David is taking for him to process this grief in a healthy way. If you look at David's lament, it could also be called, Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Which is basically, he says it three times. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Um, it's really interesting. And what he's saying is, this one hurt. This was big. This one hurt. You know, many people wonder why music and songs are so important in church, right? They're so important in church. Why are they so important in church? Throughout all of the Bible, anytime something big happened, there was a song. When the Israelites left Egypt, got through the Red Sea, what did they do? They sang a song. Uh, throughout all of the Bible, there was always a song. After Goliath killed, after uh, John, uh, David killed Goliath, there was a song. Right before the disciples were, were together with Jesus and right before Jesus was arrested, there was a song. There's always songs in the Bible because it's saying, this is big. There needs to be a song. David is saying, this is a big event in God's story. He is not downplaying the grief in any sense of the word. He's saying this is big. We need to spend time on this. You can't go over it. You can't go under it. You have to go through it. The next thing uh, David doesn't hold back in his lament is anger. A lot of us think that we can't be angry at God. David's angry. He's pretty mad. There was um, a lady in my church years ago, and um, she was, her husband passed away, and she was really mad. She was really, really mad with God. And what had happened is her anger turned into she was scared of God. And then because she was scared of God, she stopped coming to church and hid from God. The truth is, God can handle our anger. It's okay to show our anger towards God. He can handle it. Take a look at when Mary and Martha lost their brother. They were calling out for Jesus to come. When Jesus finally did come and he was dead, they yelled at Jesus. They were angry at Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He sat beside them and cried alongside them. And when he cried alongside them, all of a sudden they started feeling better. They didn't know that Jesus was just going to raise Lazarus. But that's what God does with us when we tell our anger to him. He cries alongside us to comfort us. But David doesn't stay in anger. David moves from the anger to love. He moves from the anger to love. Lament moves him through this process. It's interesting because if you remember, Saul was trying to kill David before he died. And David says, they were both loved. I love both of them. What David was doing was he was looking at Saul's whole life. And he loved Saul. You know, a lot of times the last few years when you lose someone, they might have changed. There might have been some conflict in there. It could have been addiction. It could have been dementia. It could have been a lot of different things. Or there's something that happened to them that changed. When you look back on a person, you have to look on the whole life. Mr. Rogers, yes, that Mr. Rogers always used to hold a piece of paper in his pocket wherever he went. And 
It was given to him by a social worker. And on the note, it said, you can love anyone in who you know the whole story. And I think that God does this with us. He knows our whole story. And the people in your life have a whole story. There were once children. They were once um, older. They have a whole story. You can love anyone, but you know their whole story. The last thing that David does in this whole lamenting, and it's the place where we all want to land, is that he honors the person. David writes a lament. And he says, I'm going to teach this to all the men of of Judah. He says it's going to be put in the book of Jasher. Now, we don't have the book of Jasher, but we do know some things about the book of Jasher. It's called the book of the upright ones, and it's a songs and poems about people who did big things. And so he said, I'm going to put it in this book about the people who did big things. The place that you want to land is honoring your loved ones. At my last church, uh, I had a really good friend. His name was Don. And I shared about him in a previous uh, sermon, which shows you he's a big person in my life. When I first met Don, I loved that he had a good sense of humor, and I loved that he was sarcastic. And the reason I liked that was because I'm from New Jersey. And New Jersey people are sarcastic. And Western PA people are not nearly as sarcastic as Jersey people. So anybody in Western PA who was sarcastic, I grew a liking to them because it reminded me a little bit of home. And, um, and so he, he was he a was good sense of humor. He was sarcastic. And he loved his church. He loved people. And he loved Jesus. And, and Don never missed church. I always could count on that that Don was going to be there greeting everybody as they came in. Everybody loved to see Don every Sunday. Don was 90 years old, by the way, and he was a good friend of mine. Uh, Every Sunday morning, Don and I had a ritual. We called it the sock-off. And every Sunday, we had to, to show each other your socks. And whoever had the best sock wins. Every week for years we did it, which cost me a lot more money because I had to keep getting new socks to beat Don's socks. I never really ever beat his socks. One year uh, at Christmas time, I, uh, I found a website. And I found that you could put your pictures on a sock. So for Christmas, I gave Don a pair of socks with my face on it. <laughs> and he said they were the best socks he's ever had. And I kid you not, he wore the socks all the time. Um, you know, uh, someone said to me uh, something that became very true. They said, when you're at a church for over five years... The funerals that you do are not funerals for just people in the church. In the, in the beginning years, it's for people in the, in the church. After five years, you're doing funerals for your friends. When I did Don's funeral, I did a funeral for my friend. And that was the hardest funeral I ever did as a pastor. I cried. I lamented. I went through this process of all those emotions, of feeling the anger, feeling the love, feeling everything. And I processed it, and I processed it. And where did I land? Every Sunday that I come to church, I always think about my socks. And every Sunday is an ode to my friend Don, who loved church and he loved people. I honor Don with every Sunday 
of my life, for the rest of my life, I will always think of Don and how much he loved church and he loved people. But how I got here is I had to lament. I had to feel all of those feelings. I had to process. I couldn't go over it. I couldn't go under it. I had to go through it. Many of you are dealing with something. It, it, it may not be a loss of someone's life. It could be a loss of a relationship. And that's a, I call that a loss of a dream. It could be a loss of a job that you lost this year that you really liked, or a friend. The way we go through it is that we lament. God wrote us that way. We go from this place of pain, of sadness, anger, to a time of honoring your loved one or that time in your life. And God never leaves us. He listens to our cries of anger. He moves us to think of memories, happy and hard ones. But if we're faithful to the process, and God's involvement in us. And we land in the place of honoring Him for the rest of our lives.